Okay, welcome everyone to today's webinar on effective writing strategies with Broadford Primary School. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Malcolm Drakes, who's the executive head teacher of Broadford uh, Primary School, which is one of Whole Education's uh, partner schools. Um, the school uh, serves one of the poorest areas uh, in London um, and is, though, a very fun and jolly place to learn, um, from what I've heard from Malcolm himself and also the children at the school. Um, just before I hand over to Malcolm, um, if you would like to ask a question, um, we'd like you to hold those um, until the end of Malcolm's presentation. But if for any reason um, you can't uh, be heard, please do email me um, at the email address that you can see at the bottom of this screen, so natasha at wholeeducation.org. Uh, um, so I'm going to hand straight over to Malcolm, um, who can tell you a little bit more about his school um, and uh, share some effective writing strategies that they use there to improve outcomes for young people. So over to you, Malcolm. I'm just sharing my screen with you now. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, I haven't done one of these before, so if I appear to be talking in the wrong direction towards the camera, please forgive me. Um, I've got a presentation to run you through, so hopefully if I were to do this, then, hang on, that might help, um, exit that one, I'll stop the right display, here we go, um, I drive, inset and training, that would be good, improving writing, whole education, and present. Can everyone see the slides now? Yep, everyone should be able to see Can you see that? So that's fine. Oh, good. Okay, then I'll get going. Great. Um, Natasha, we're giving you a bit of um, an insight into our school. So this is the front entrance to Balfour Primary, and we're on an area called Harold Hill, which is just outside of Romford, in the far furthest extreme of East London, before you cross into Essex. Um, to give you an idea about the rural for context, um, as Natasha was saying, we serve one of the poorest communities in East London. The Bright Road Estate, which we back onto, is one of only two council wards over the last 10 years has got poorer comparatively to surrounding areas. And typically our school has around 50 to 60 percent of pupils who are pupil premium. We have a year six children who just left. 70 percent of those were eligible for pupil premium. Um, so it's really quite a deprived context. Um, so just to give you an idea of where we've been, when I was appointed head teacher in 2011, the school was in special measures. We achieved the year before I arrived only 58% of pupils were managing to get the combined reading, writing, and maths. We were way down the list of schools nationally for the amount of progress that we made, and we had very poor output for more able pupils across the board at early years, key stage one, and then at key stage two. So you can see from those reading schools, very few pupils going on to achieve the higher percentages. And so I'm going to talk you through some of the measures that we've put in place over the course of the last five years, and the impact of that would be if you were to take the 2016 results, which aren't directly comparable, but um, I think would be acknowledged to be harder to achieve. Um, we managed to have reading, writing and maths of a combined 81% against the national of about 53. Um, our writing progress score was 2.39. The reading, looking at the key stage 2 test outcomes compared to key stage 1 was 8.6, which um, I think, as my SIP said, was off the charts. And the number of readers that we had a high scale score uh, was 56% against a national average of 19%. So I would say that the measures we put in place, which I'm going to talk you through very quickly now, have had a fantastic um, positive and direct impact on the um, quality of the children's education, and that's been borne out by the results. Um, so moving on, we've kind of talked about um, the deprivation indicators. We also find that, I'm sure many of you would come across this, that if you have the de um, deprivation, the biggest impact that has is particularly in early years and the quality of language that they come in with. We're finding high, much higher percentages of pupils now have got speech and language issues um, or are coming from EAL families where there's no prior knowledge of English. And so it's imperative that we get put in place as quickly as possible these steps to ensure that by the time they leave us at the end of year six, we're either at or above the national expectation. Um, so we've worked very hard. I know this is a focus on reading and writing, but certainly what I want to impress upon anyone who was listening today, that none of this would have been possible if it wasn't for the fact that all of the staff buy into our shared vision. 
being in such an area makes it very easy to have a cast iron moral purpose that we don't want to have any um, limiting factor on the children's future attainment because of their socio-economic background. Everything that we do in the early years from the minute they cross the threshold is all designed to ensure that by the time they reach the age of six they're reading confidently. And because we're aware of the low levels of literacy and poor attitudes towards education across the community, we want to ensure we've got as much engagement as possible to ensure that we get the attendance up there to a 96% plus, because if the kids aren't with us, then obviously we can't do anything with them. And the attendance has been another one of the success stories over the course of the last five years, where it was significantly up and down 90% as a school, but now we typically have a, um, attain, a attendance that's at 96% or higher. And the staff, having agreed their vision and understanding the moral purpose of why we do what we do, have got three values which they work on their behaviour every day. This is the, the stuff that is supposed to drive every decision they make, the way they behave in every lesson, the way they behave in the corridor. They must show integrity, they must do their job, they must understand their role, they must deliver their planning on time, get their letters ready on time, they must do what they say they're going to do, the Ron Seal test really, for their integrity. We want their lessons, their teaching of writing, reading to be inspirational so that our children are able to break out of a cycle of deprivation and everything they do should have impact and they should be able to evidence the positive and direct impact that's having on pupil progress and attainment. So having set up a very clear shared vision and having clear everyday values that drive their behaviours, we feel that's made a significant difference to the way in which all these other things to do with reading and writing have had an impact. And the pupils have got three shared values which they're expected to do. They come to school every day on time, they're expected to do their best in every lesson and they're expected to be kind and polite to everyone they meet. They are on one negotiables and pretty much every conversation you have with a child can come back to one of those three key areas for them. Just like we've agreed with staff and with governors and parents, we have the same high expectations for our pupils. And then we have four learning behaviours that we've agreed as a staff that we're going to work on and there's a shared language there too from the moment they walk in through the door about reflecting on their learning and learning to improve, the reciprocity, the teamwork, the partner work, being resilient in the face of a challenge and then being able to be resourceful if they're faced with a challenge that's difficult. So across the school, a theme I think which will come out through this presentation is the consistency of language, consistency of approach, consistency of a shared vision, understanding of our moral purpose. And without those foundations, I think any of the measures I was going to talk through with you probably wouldn't work in quite the same way, which is why we to start the presentation with those few slides. Um, so to move on then, I think the Natasha sent around some information that we we're going to talk about our shared genre planning grids and the way in which we try and encourage a shared language around the sentence types that we use. Um, so the first is basically I would, if I was going to ask you to undertake an activity, it would be to walk into a year six class in your school and ask them what they think the features of a newspaper report are and hopefully you might get four or five suggestions about the key paragraphs and features that should be contained. Then walk into the next year six class and possibly the next year six class depending on how many forms of entry you've got. And is it the case that all three classes all have the same expectations about the features of a newspaper report? If you then went down the corridor to year five, would your year five classes have the same expectations about what the key features of a newspaper report are. If you went to that teacher in year four who's been with you for only a term because they're an NQT, would they have the same expectations about what the features of the newspaper report are? And this is nothing to do with Broadford Primary, it's something that came through Alan P training which we had a few years ago and we've decided to take on board. Um, if you're going to have success with your writing, there would need to be a collegiate approach across all of your staff. We certainly found at Broadford that one of the issues was that the lack of achievement wasn't down to consistently inadequate teaching, it was down to consistently different teaching. Teachers had different languages around newspaper report features, teachers had different expectations about the level they expected the children to reach within that year group, teachers had different language around the sentence types they were trying to use, and as a child progressing through the school, that can be incredibly confusing. It also means that if they can't articulate to you clearly what the features of a news report, newspaper report are, it's unlikely they're going to be able to write one effectively, particularly unaided. 
and that we want our school to have a progressive collegiate approach so that as the pupils move through, the structure itself doesn't change, but the language and the expectation of that language does become increasingly more complex, but it means they can go into each lesson confident they know what it is the teacher is going to be expecting of them and what the technical terms are that are going to be used. And we found that's made a huge difference. Um, if I was doing it with the staff, what I'd ask them to do now would be to take two minutes and write down their key features of either a newspaper article, some instructions, a recount, and then in that staff meeting I'd ask them to turn to their partner and then compare, have they used the same language, have they got the features in the same order, because if they haven't, then probably there needs to be some work done there on the level of consistency across that year group or across that phase or across that key stage to ensure the children are all getting a consistently excellent deal and the language is the same. What we don't want, and that we found, is that children are having to consistently be retrained each year as they move forward from year three to year four or year four to year five, and that's just lost learning time. That's a waste for everyone. The consistency that we have across our genre planning grids um, is also there with our consistent vocabulary about sentence types. We also expect our staff to have a consistency with the way in which they play with language and present it as something fun to be doing to get the children to become more curious about words, where they came from, how they're formed, how they're linked together, and especially modelling. The staff are expected to dip in and out of the staff library to use that to inform their practice and everything that they show the children should be presented in context. And we've had conversations as a school about the use of powerful words and then just plastering them all over the wall. But that's a very little use to our intake of children who aren't able to really understand a word unless they can see it used in the context of a sentence. And they need to see that all the time. So we expect our staff to consistently ensure that all their language and key terms are always given a context within the classroom rather than just lots of displays that have very little meaning. So what it would look like, our genre, our genre grid is a simple table. It outlines the features, some of the people to think about, and there's a sentence starter. So if I was to break out the presentation, I should be able to show you what this looks like in practice. Uh, we use a Google domain system so that everyone can see all of the documents that we share as a school. And then assuming that the document is going to load for me, here we go. There's some blurb for the teachers on how it works. There are um, the sentence types are included within the pack, so they can clearly see they're called two A sentences. Every teacher refers to them as two A sentences. You've got some examples of how they work. Um, you've then got some teaching tips where the teacher is pointed, is pointed out to them to make sure they draw attention to the commas to see if they can extend this by using alliteration, to try and not, and then some teaching points to make sure they avoid using more than two adjectives together. So you can see a range of sentence types there, each with the teaching tips and the exemplification so that all of the staff are all using the same language all of the time. And then as we move forward, I apologize for the speed of the scrolling, when we get onto our shared genre planning grids, um, I'll come back to the word play games in a moment. That's another part of the presentation. So again, these are all shared, and you can see here with how to write instructions, it's got the features, what to think about, some examples, and some sentence types that could be included. So I would expect in my school that all of the children, if you said, what's required when you write instructions, they would say, Mr. Drakes, you need a title. You need to tell me why you need these instructions. You need to tell me about the equipment or ingredients that are going to be used and you need to tell me the method that you're going to have to achieve the outcome and finally there will be a statement at the end that will tell me how I know I've been successful. And then as you can see from within this genre grid as the teacher goes to it, there are some examples of what this might be like, how to bake a cake, how to catch goblins without being bitten. And then there are some different features that could be included. Now, it doesn't matter whether they're year two, year three, year four, year five, year six. A set of instructions will always have a title. You'll always have to say why you need them. You'll always have to give the equipment or ingredients. You'll always have to give me the method. And you'll always have to conclude the sentence to let me know how they've been successful. The progressive part of it obviously comes in the expectation for the sentence types and the vocabulary and the position of the instructions. That's where you would build it towards the higher retainers as you move towards the end of year six. 
that every child knows what makes a set of instructions, they know what goes into writing a recount, they know if they flip forward what goes into writing an explanation, they know what goes into writing a non-chronological report. And across our school, one of our strengths, I believe, is that this is laid out for all the teachers, whether they're here for the first week or whether they're um, in a position where they've been with the school a bit longer, the booklet is there to underpin all of their classroom practice. Um, moving forward, um, we tried to give lots of examples about, I mean, consistency for us is something that we do in a whole different range of areas. Um, the idea being that we have silent signals which we take from our read writing. That's the predominant vehicle we use for teaching literacy in Key Stage 1. And the silent signals from read writing, the silent hand signals, the one, two, three, to move the children around the classroom, the turn to your partner signal, the my turn, your turn. Those silent signals are used by all teachers in all lessons across all parts of the school from early years all the way up to year six. So we're very consistent there as well. Everyone's got the same pupil values, even to the point where all of our staff have all got the same coat design of coat, so that when we're all out in the outdoor area, you've got a clear vision of who's staff and who isn't. The writing displays expectations around the school, which I'll show you in just a moment and the general level of signage to ensure there's a consistency of language and expectation. So, big write and sentence size. One of the things I was asked to talk to you about was how we approach the practical aspects of writing. You've got those underpinning aspects with the sentence types, and you've got the genre planning grids. Um, every Friday is the big write Friday. But one of the things we found was that the big write was too standalone on a Friday, you might be having one genre one week, a different genre the week after. So now the teachers have changed it, so we block our genres, we link it to their literacy and language topics in Key Stage 2, which are as a kind of an add-on to the Read Range program, and then they do the same genre for three weeks. In week one, they'll be doing their initial piece of work, and the teacher will mark that and identify some key improvements to be made. In week two, They'll do the same style of work again and then be able to implement the improvements, possibly looking at some of those during their early morning work in the four, because they've done the piece of work on the Friday. Teacher will have marked it and they'll have early morning work on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, where they've got the opportunity to edit and improve. On the second week, they'll write again, and there should be clear progress between the quality that's been done in week one to week two. And then finally, week three is just the finished article. And we found that by giving each genre three clear weeks and giving the children a meaningful opportunity to edit and improve that piece of work means that they're able to evidence far greater progress and have a much better understanding of the genre by the time they're finished. Um, the other thing we look for in the classroom are clear models for instructions that are on display for the children to see, models that exemplify high quality um, standards. We've got the quality of language there. They must be visible from the back of the classroom because quite often we found that displays teachers were putting up didn't actually, were also weren't actually visible for those children who were sitting any distance from that board. So our teachers have worked very hard in ensuring that they've got the right quality of display to ensure that the children are able to benefit from it and use it to support their writing. Um, the sentence types, you can see a kind of a whole plethora of them on this board. And they're exemplified within that booklet, it's available to all the teachers, and they tend to choose one focus sentence type for that genre, so they're not overloading the children. You wouldn't expect all of those sentences to be taught in every week. You'd pick one, link it to that genre, or what you're doing in literature and language and your big right goal, incorporate that one genre, that one type of sentence throughout the week, and then the stocking fillers relate to an activity we do as a warm-up before they're writing on the Friday, and then that would be the success. Well, it would be part of the success criteria for your big write on the Friday that you'd want to see that specific type of sentence. You'd have three opportunities: week one, week two, week three, where you'd be able to include that specific sentence type. But if you were doing that, that means you're doing two sentence types per half term, which would mean over the course of the year that's 12 different sentence types which would mean from year three to year six alone, you've covered all of them and had plenty of chance for consolidation, but have covered them in a meaningful way in context to ensure maximum impact. In terms of rewards, that's the key part of what we do. So you, uh, I've got members of staff who give out chocolate footballs for using the focus sentence of the week, and they have a Champions League table for the number of children who've scored the most of goals. We've got um, space for children to stick their post-its on the displays as they move forward to show how they've edited and improved. 
These sentences have been a way of picking out who's going to be the star writer of the week ready for assembly, where they're going to get their gold and pencil and certificate to be able to take home. And that reward system and the high profile of literacy around the school really shows, I think, the high expectations for the outcomes we expect all of the children to have. Outside every class, they've all got a consistent board where they're expected to display their star writer of the week, the book that they're currently reading at the moment, and then there's a word jail where as you walk into the classroom, you're not allowed to use any of the words that's in the word jail. And that's something that varies from class to class depending on which particular habit it is that the teacher is trying to squash. But we find that this general celebration of the writing and the reading outside every class has really given literally a high profile within our school and impressed upon the children the need for high standards and everything they do. And this celebration with the certificates, the golden pencils, the word jails, has impressed upon them just how key it is that they have high quality writing and reading. And then those children who do particularly good pieces of work have their writing shared on our website. Um, you've also got whole school displays of the writing. Once it's been outside the classroom, it moves to the whole school display. And then obviously if they've done any writing as the class, we want to celebrate that as much as possible. So we encourage our teachers to have high quality displays around the building to celebrate the writing and poetry they've been doing. Um, the next thing I'd mention in terms of school improvement would be the standards. We've kind of touched on this already, that if you were to walk into one class and ask them what they'd expect to see in a set of instructions, what would you expect to see in the second class? Hopefully the same. In terms of standards, one of the things we had come up was that if you were to ask your staff, when, by the end of what year would you expect a child to be able to write a simple sentence, which is um, complete with a capital letter and a full stop? And it might be interesting to get the view of your staff, because if you get any difference between some people saying, well, I think that could happen in reception, I think that could happen in year one, straight away you've got an issue with standards, because not everyone is expecting the same. And certainly none of the staff here would say they've got anything less than high standards. But when we went through this activity, where we went down that list of sentences, we had some quite different ideas. Some people thought that use of a connective with when, if, or but wouldn't occur until year three, end of year three. Some people thought it should be happening at the end of year one, so there's a two-year gap. Some people thought the experimenting with language for effect with imagery, metaphors and similes should be occurring in year three. Some people put it in year five. And if, as a school, you've got teachers possibly working in the same year group and they've got very different expectations about when children should be expected to reach particular milestones, you're probably going to have a problem with the outcomes at the end because they won't be of a consistently high quality. In terms of outstanding standards across the lines, we've got a pledge to our logbook and our writing where we talk about the quality of handwriting and the standard of presentation. We expect when we go in and observing lessons that we'll see the teacher modelling how they write on lines, showing children the ascenders and descenders being placed in context. And we've got a teaching and learning policy which is full of a checklist for different aspects of what we do during the school day, whether it's displays, early morning work, um, what we expect to see in our marking policy and that consistency of standards means that we build towards an outstanding outcome certainly when we were inspected in 2014 and we feel that's part of the reason that we've managed to maintain outstanding outcomes since then. Um, the early morning work was mentioned by Natasha in the um, flyer that got sent round to you and our approach to marking. So if we moved on to that part now, so I'm just conscious of the time. That we have a soft start to the day with the doors opening at 8.30 in the morning. The pupils then stagger their way into class as they turn up, they enter the building and come on in. We don't officially register until 8.55 like most schools, but it does mean that the vast majority of children are in by 8.40. Um, there's a large number of them that are in at 8.30, so they've gained almost 25 minutes of extra time. We found as a school that calm starts the day with the music playing in class, the welcome environment meant that behaviour issues that we used to have before school with um, Ill, um, illicit football matches going on and parental disputes, it all vanished almost overnight. And it's gained back some valuable time where you can do some of this small group work. It's allowed us to develop time where children can meaningfully respond to marking that's been done in their books. It allows the teacher to pre-teach work to small groups. It could be the more able children. Um, I've got a number of teachers who would use it as a time to take their most able pupils, go through with them a particular activity they want them to work on during the lesson, so that when the main lesson starts, the more able pupils are able just to get on, and the teacher can then work with those pupils they want to focus with to ensure they understand the objective. 
It also gives our pupils the chance to edit and improve their work and give them some meaningful time to do it. Certainly what's been difficult is we wanted to change the attitude too to editing because a lot of staff initially felt that editing was something you do when you've made a mistake, whereas we want our editing to be done simply to improve the quality. So it might be that you haven't spelled a single word wrong, there's not a single grammatical error and it all makes perfect sense. However, you can still edit and improve that because the quality of word choices could be improved, the quality of imagery could be improved, the impact on the reader could be improved. And we also have an expectation that when they come in there might be a creative oral and mental starter available. And once again, we don't need this to chance, we don't expect teachers to have to go off and find their own resources. We provide them with a, a booklet um, for mental and oral starters which contains a number of literacy activities. They've only got to click into their Google Drive and they'll find a booklet packed with examples of challenges and activities which their children would be able to do. Just let the document load for you so you can see some of them. Um, so you've got, if it were going to load, um, attributes webs where they can look at different, um, you know, one second. Well, I'll let that load, I'll come back to that and then um, we'll carry on for the moment. The, um, the writing challenges and the fun part of it is built into that writing book, so I'll run you through some of them now. For instance, you can do lipograms with the children, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, all the king's horses and all the king's men. So basically, you take that tiny extract, rewrite it, don't use the word, the letter O. You must keep the meaning the same. You can use more words to replace one word. So instead of all the king's horses, you could have stallions, you could have had and sat on the wall, sat astride the wall, so it gives us a challenge there for your more able pupils to have a look at the vocabulary that they're choosing for their, um, their writing. You could then give them a glidogram, seven words written as a list, and then each word has to contain a specific letter. You would agree that letter at the start of the activity, and then gradually you move it through. For instance, you might take ant, bag, brain, strange. You can see the A gradually moving through to the right and then back to the left. Some other games might be where you give them the first and last letter of a word and then they have to fill it. And the more letters you can add, the more points you score. So the word blood would only score you three points, but of course if you were particularly powerful you might have come up with bewildered or artichoke and you'd score far many more points. And we found these are great ways to get the children interested in vocabulary, challenge the more able pupils, really get them looking at literacy in a fun way. Um, it, it's possible to take it further if you wanted because you could then look at moving it through, so you go from bad to bold to bread to banded, increasing each word by one letter each time. Limitless possibilities. Um, moving forward onto our approach to reading, because I want to talk to you about um, our reading approach and how we've improved our writing outcomes. Our librarian is probably one of our greatest resources, um, and she's got a dedicated library area where she runs lots of challenges and activities for our pupils and promotes reading. Um, she runs a spine breakers club which is for our more able pupils who go out to Waterstones, buy the books, they um, promote the books in class. We have a link between the books that are in the library and the rewriting groups. Um, she runs a lot of challenges through the Literacy Trust and is a great way of linking with our local library. And She also organises all of our author visits, which we have every half term. So it's not something that we just have a on a termly basis. And in terms of a restructure, I'm, I'm sure like many of you, we're facing budget cuts, we're facing a shrinking financial position, but the librarian is the last person of all who I would look to restructure. I'd keep um, Miss Sparks, um, I'd kind of have to sell the, the, um, the family furniture before I let Miss Sparks go because the librarian has been such a huge impact on the quality of reading, the promotion of reading and therefore the quality of writing that we've had. And certainly there's a recent article out from the Book Trust and Chris Riddell, the children's um, laureate who have again emphasised the importance of librarians and that role within your school to promote literacy. Um, what we've also found with reading to writing is that if you're teaching newspapers, it's very simple tweaks. Are there any newspapers available in class? Are you reading newspapers to the children at the end of the day? Are you sharing the news articles on the website and different formats of news now, whether it's online or paper? If you're teaching them fairy tales, um, are you reading them fairy tales? Is a fairy tale their end of day story? 
And certainly what we talk to all of our teachers about is that every child is entitled to hear a story at the end of the day for the last 15 minutes. And there's a progression built in across key, um, early years to Key Stage 2 where we've outlined the key books we want them to read and experience while they're at Broadford. So I know that a child journeying through from nursery through to year 6 will have experienced a whole range of stories and sometimes the same story but told in different ways. Um, so aims achieved. Hopefully, one well, of my top tips would be, if I was asking a school who would listen to this, have you got the time to agree an approach to the genre so that all of you use the same paragraphs in the same order, with the same language, and the same sentence types, and you have a similar expectation of when you'd expect to see that achieved? Are you able to find some time in the school day? Could you have a soft start in the morning? Is there a way to get more meaningful time to edit and improve their writing and give the children to reflect on the teacher's marking? Is there time to build in fun for literacy so you can look at word play games and get the children to explore it without having the pressure of the writing expectations? And how well do you promote literacy around the school? If I came to visit your school, would literacy hit me between the eyes? Would I be bowled over by the writing that I see on display and the celebration of reading and books? So that's it. Any questions? Is that still working, Natasha? Fantastic. Yes, thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, I'm conscious that it's uh, 4.31, so we're just going to stay online just for another five minutes just to give people an opportunity to ask uh, Malcolm questions. So if I just go round, um, Amy, do you have any questions for Malcolm at all? No, thanks. Okay. Um, Jane? Any questions for Malcolm at all? No, uh, Janet? No. Okay. Uh, Jason, I know you're with um, a team of staff at the moment. Have you guys got any questions for Malcolm at all? Uh, okay. Joe, any questions at all? Laura, any questions? Oh, everyone's very quiet today. Uh, Lucy, any questions at all? No. Uh, and Sherry, any questions at all? No, Malcolm, it looks like we have no questions for you today. Okay. Um, I think it was... Uh, I thought you gave us such a great selection, though, there of um, of strategies that people can apply to the classroom, um, and it was fantastic. I think what would you say is what would you say is the biggest challenge um, for your staff in the school um, at the moment with with writing, and and how are you overcoming that? I think the biggest issue is the consistency of expectation in growing teams, because when I first started at Broadford in 2011, it was only one and a half form entry school. And we've grown to a two form of entry, now it's a three form of entry, and we're federated with Mead Primary. So effectively, in most year groups, we're actually a six form of entry school. And to ensure that all six teachers in that year group have all got similarly high expectations and an equally clear understanding of what they need to do to get the children to the correct writing outcome, I think that's the, the biggest challenge. And we've got enough, we've got enough of, I think it's, uh, 12 teachers in key stage two, seven of them are in their first two years of teaching. So making sure that teachers who are very new to you very quickly get inducted, understand where these resources are, know what the expectations are, so that those children aren't missing out. And so we found with recruitment being a bit of an issue, the number of Teach First students we've taken on, or Skip Program students, or NQTs that we've got, is vital. You have as a school those key resources that you can go to as part of their inductions and make sure that they're not missing out. Because from what I've seen before, those teachers who aren't teaching at the level you expect as an SLT do an observation, normally because they haven't got the resources and the access to them or the subject knowledge. So you need to really ensure there's as much there as possible to back them up and get them ready for teaching the high quality yeah. lessons you want to see. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, thank you very much for that, Malcolm. Um, as we've got, uh, I've not received any other questions. Um, ah, I've got, just received one question um, from uh, Hannah. Um, 
So, uh, and the question is, if Malcolm would suggest one change we could make, what would it be? And this is from Hannah and uh, Jason at St. John's, which is part of the Keys uh, Federation up in Wigan. So the uh, question is, did you get the question with your staff? Malcolm? Yeah, no, I, I, okay. I probably haven't discussed with your staff this idea of a shared approach to the genres, so that you don't find that some, I mean, everyone in your school could all be teaching perfectly well, but if they're teaching every genre slightly differently, their impact is going to be lessened. So if you could agree a common language that we are all going to, when we teach a newspaper, say that you need to have a title, you need to have, you could have it the 5W paragraph or the lead paragraph or the header paragraph, it doesn't matter what you call it, but you all call it the same and you've got the same expectation of what you're going to find in that paragraph. And I think you'll find it easier to compare writing across the school, to be able to exemplify progression, so the children will find it less confusing. And it's just that conversation with staff about what they want to see in each paragraph of each type of genre. Fantastic. Okay. Great. And I've uh, I've got so I've got. Um, let me just check if I've got any other questions. No, I think that's it for questions. So I guess all that's left is to say again, thank you very much, Malcolm, for, for leading today's webinar. Um, I think I, I certainly really enjoyed that, and I hope everyone else online did uh, too. Um, I just wanted to um, flag up to everyone um, the annual conference um, that's taking place in January. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen. So it's on the 26th and 27th of January um, this uh, next year, rather, for whole education. Um, day one is going to focus on doing uh, achieving more with less. Um, we've got breakouts on uh, topics such as harnessing technology to achieve more with less, um, rethinking curriculum pedagogy and resources at primary. Um, we've got speakers including uh, Professor Tim Brighouse, um, Neil, Neil Carmichael, who is the chair of the Education Select Committee, and Caroline Waters, who is the deputy chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, day two of our conference on the 27th of January is being facilitated by Professor Andy Hargreaves, and we also have a keynote speaker, um, which is Sir David uh, Carter. So if anyone is interested in attending, please do go to our website, www.wholeeducation.org. Um, okay, and on that note, uh, thank you all very much for joining us, and um, we look forward to you joining us for future webinars. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.